Hello, Void and all who inhabit it. It's me. And before we get started, I just want to be super clear that this is not a transphobe friendly channel. Unless I point out how something distinctly impacts or is experienced by trans women, when I say black women, I'm including all black women. When I say women in general, I'm including all women. If that's not a viewpoint you're interested in hearing from, feel free to stop listening. To everyone else, happy pride. So writing this took a while. Unlike the other two trope videos I've done so far, I didn't have a specific character or characters in mind. There are still some very obvious, more traditional leaning mammy figures in media, but as I was trying to think of a remix one, I realized that the mammy trope has been distilled and attached to multiple types of black women characters. I could say that the sassy black friend is the mammy mixed with the sapphire, but so too is a random black woman whose sharp comment helps a main character realize something. Then, of course, there is the black best friend slash sidekick who has no family, no other connections seemingly than the main white character. And what about the black characters who continue to sacrifice themselves literally for the betterment of white characters? There's at least three different tropes all rooted in the mammy stereotype. And that's not to say that the same couldn't be pulled from the Jezebel and the Sapphire, but rather that many derivatives from the Mammy trope connect back to the same characteristics. So this breakdown is going to be a little different because instead of unpacking any one new remix trope, I'm instead focusing on a few key remixed traits. But first, what is the Mammy trope? Dr. David Pilgrim, in part of his work with the Jim Crow Museum, summarizes the caricature as that of an obese, coarse maternal figure, completely desexualized, a faithful worker. She had no black friends, the white family was her entire world. Though the most well-known and perhaps the namesake of this stereotype was portrayed by Hattie McDaniel in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, this depiction dates as far back as 1852 with Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. A trope as old as time, you might say. This image has had immeasurable impact on American media and depictions of black women ever since. Returning to Dr. Pilgrim's summary of the mammy, we can pull the major traits that are used in shallow and or negative portrayals of black women across media. Being a caretaker, being undesired, and or being plus-sized and dark-skinned as a signifier of behavior or morality. Starting with the caretaker, this is the main trait that gets passed along and is what people are referring to when they casually call a character a mammy. From the therapist to the random lady in the grocery store to the co-worker, these women are meant to ultimately be a resource for their white character. However, caretaker is really flexible. It's no longer just being a domestic worker or explicitly in a service role. The dedication of care given to the white character's story means our black woman in question gives up everything from screen time to character development to her actual fictional life for the betterment of others. The black best friend slash sidekick is the most obvious and pervasive implementation of this trait. But when those characters are men, as they often are, they aren't treated the same. Black sidekicks tend to get a little bit more worth. They're still flat, they still may be shown to have no other connections than the white character, but they have a little bit more weight in the story, and recently are more often being shown as the smart collected half of a duo. Black women caretaker characters, on the other hand, are just that. There often isn't even the guise that they may be equal to the other characters. They are here to protect, uplift, encourage, but not really exist independently. I think there is a lot of overlap, but there is a difference between being a token who flatly exists and being a tool who exists only to be used. Many black female caretaker characters lean towards the latter. There are a plethora of examples to pull from for this trait. But y'all mind if I talk about Abby Mills right quick? 
If you've never seen Sleepy Hollow, congratulations on sparing yourself from a massive disappointment, but the show was a supernatural drama loosely based off the short story The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and starred Nicole Bahari and Tom Misson as co-leads Abby Mills and Ichabod Crane. Despite Abby Mills being a protagonist and literally at the center of a major piece of mythos running through the show, the writers found a way to diminish her screen time severely by the start of the second season and barely develop her character before killing her off at the end of the third season. Abby is the greatest example in recent memory of the disillusion of a character to the point of basically being set dressing. What is so wild about the development of Abby's story, or the destruction of it rather, is that she is a main character. She is a protagonist. She is one of two who the show is supposed to revolve around. And yet, the bulk of care was given to the white character's story. By the end, we were told that Abby is there to do whatever she could to make sure that Ichabod could continue. In terms of this trait, the writing of Abby's story is a good example of the expectation that any black woman, even ones at the center of the plot, become subservient for someone else's story. And also that Orlando Jones has some terrible karma around supernatural fantasy-based TV shows. But anyway, a lot of black fans loved Abby, but when others reacted positively to Katrina, who's Ichabod's witch wife, the plot took a hard left to focus on the Crane family. It's worth noting which parts of fandom have enough impact to affect what eventually happens on the screen and how they often aren't the parts that care about people of color in general, much less black women. I think producers are willing to have a character be played by a black woman, but as soon as a sizable chunk of the audience declares that, we want this woman to remain an instrument in the background of the white character's story, the writers and showrunners and producers hop on it because low-key that's what they wanted to do as well. Regardless, we have seen that influence from audiences can have several different impacts on a character to the point that they can get killed off or just more vaguely written off. But if the character has to stick around and Abby had to stick around until they could figure out a way to kill her, then that character just gets downgraded to being a talking Swiss army knife. The investment in images and stories of black women as subservient is to get us to buy into the idea of black women as utilities. But there is some part of this perspective of black women as caretakers only that is absolutely connected to disbelief that we could be desired, which takes us into our next trait. Wanting characters to have the potential to be partnered isn't always about seeing romance on the screen, but also about getting to see characters being taken care of, having emotional growth and bonds, taking up space in the narrative. If there's other people a character could be caring about, other points in their story that could benefit them separately, then one, that's time the writers have to spend caring about their development and is also time taken away from others. And two, that means recognizing this character as more than just a plot device. An easy way to avoid both those things is to just not give them any romance. I could spend quite a bit of time talking about all the different ways black women are removed as potential romantic partners in media, but most of them boil down to two main images. There is the sexually aggressive, unrelenting, and unwilling to understand that don't nobody want her black woman, whose behavior is a mix of the Sapphire and the Jezebel. And then there is the sexless, unconsidered, not even an option if you wanted her to be black woman that has a direct line back to the mammy trope. I did a video on Sela from Sela and the Spades and how coding her as ace somewhat fits into the second bucket. But the point from that video that's applicable here is that black women characters being coded as asexual or aromantic by way of them rarely if ever showing interest in anyone and only fleeting interest at that is a means of justifying her lack of deeper emotional bonds in general. Intimacy is not just romantic or sexual, but a lot of media, a lot of audiences, put the most worth in the romantic partnerships we see on screen. Characters that aren't given romantic storylines in shows or movies where everyone else is are characters who often end up with weaker connections overall. For black women specifically, the continued depiction of a shallow and flawed idea of asexuality is a means by which to keep her connectionless. 
we can't have this woman caring about anyone else because she's meant to be a multi-purpose tool and that can't happen if she's shown to have other desires or connections that make her human. Though I will say in terms of outside connections in general, there is an exception kinda in the choice to give black women characters children. But really, kids are also just a way to mark them as unavailable because you know, moms don't ever have sex again, apparently. And I think there's still the question of how much do these kids get to exist as something more than a reason to pull this character away? Like, does this woman have a relationship with her children or does the child just exist as a reason why she can't do X, Y, Z? You know what I mean? But pulling back to being without romantic relationships, Abby is again a good example of this. She starts the show with three different men interested in her, but as the story degrades, her potential romantic options evaporate. And the ones she is given feel like pandering, like, You can't say we didn't care about her because here, Lance Gross. But there isn't really any intention of giving Abby a fulfilling partnership. Some other examples include Bonnie from Vampire Diaries, Tara from True Blood, Maria Rambeau from Captain Marvel, Joss Carter from Person of Interest, and Alex from Totally Spies. These women don't get the same strength of romantic relationships as other characters in their media, if they get any at all. The choice to not give these women a romantic relationship, or to only give them lackluster ones, can be seen as a choice to keep them focused. That focus, however, is often turned to the other major white characters or points in the plot that impact the main storyline as opposed to their individual growth and stories. Also, I again have to bring up that we can see audience reaction as a place where this perception of black women, as sexless beings in this case, is amplified. It's not hard to find the sentiment of don't partner her with anyone because she's a strong independent woman who don't need no man. Ain't nobody too strong for some dick or some coup or what have you. No one is independent to the point of not needing any connections or relationships. But when a black woman exists, when she exists a little too closely to someone that the audience may find attractive or want to see partnered with someone else, now all of a sudden that black woman needs to be kept alone lest she be distracted. A good example of this within a story actually is Marina and Penelope from Bridgerton. Penelope is having a whole lot of fun treating Marina as her pet project, but she gets shook shitless when the man Marina wants is Penelope's friend and crush. Then it's time to cut the cameras. And considering that the show expanded on Marina's storyline from the book, the choice to not only make her the unexpectedly most eligible bachelorette, but also to have Penelope still not view her as deserving enough to bag Colin is flagrant. Penelope is nicer about it, but she's just like her mama. To be honest, she doesn't see Marina as a girl who should be in their world. The story is a great example, I think unintentionally so, of how black women can be viewed as simultaneously pawns and obstacles for someone else's story. As light as baby girl is, her happiness and comfort could not be allowed to take precedent over Penelope's. Ultimately, we're working with an idea that without additional ties as a distraction, black women can hone all their time, energy, and attention on a specific character. In a media landscape that highly values romance, this mindset of being distractionless is amplified with regards to black women's romantic potential. Now, if you view black women as unattractive, as undesirable, having her be distraction free is an easy setup, but it begins to wobble when the black woman makes connections on her own, draws in attention on her own, either in the story or with the audience. So now there's a fear a heavy dislike, let's say, of a black woman character as competition, mixing with an inability to perceive her as attractive that results in the production of stories where black women characters are just kept single or given thinned out romances. Any black woman character can be reduced to being a shallow, sexless caretaker of others, 
But when shows and films want to denote that a woman is here to fulfill that role in the shortest amount of time, creators fall back on a specific set of physical traits. Being plus sized, darker skinned, and dressed modestly is used as shorthand to point to a character as an undeveloped sexless supporting figure only. Though what is framed as the least desired body is a microcosm of several isms and phobias clashing together, perhaps the first clear distillation of this as the physical antithesis to the ideal woman is seen in the mammy trope. Fat phobia is woven throughout our institutions and social structures, and it is also inherently anti-Black. Dr. Sabrina Strings has done a lot of research into the 19th century roots of messaging that paired weight with skin color and connected them both to low morality. While Dr. Strings' research focuses on the scientific and medical materials released at the time, we can also see this image in fictional media of the lowly, humble, fat black woman rising during the mid-19th century. Dr. Strings' work isn't just about tracking how we got here, but unraveling how these ideas continue to influence our perception of fatness and health today. From a cultural lens, Western media has been steeped in this weight-related value signaling for centuries, and the people often used to make that point are black women. As a result, in media, darker-skinned plus-sized women are placed in a binary of either being aggressive burdens or being tolerated only as servants. Which brings me, sadly, to black men in fat suits. There are numerous black men in comedy who have performed either one of the aforementioned caricatures of black women, many of whom even built their platforms off of them. I get that a lot of people find these images funny and feel justified in that because it's not the real person you're laughing at, it's this exaggerated version, but I don't think it's that easy. In The Weight of Misrepresentation, author Brianna McVoy writes, because the audience realizes that Medea is not a genuine portrayal of a woman, they laugh at many extreme behaviors. She is easily placed in the category of other, Categorizing her as a subhuman creature allows the audience to laugh at her absurdity. She is the essence of what a stereotype is, an idea constructed to look away from the truth. Medea is top of mind because I just did a whole bunch of reading on Tyler Perry, but I think a similar impact can be said across the board for black men who perform these specific caricatures of black women. Beyond the harm of not getting to see women like this exist beyond limited portrayals, many people stop perceiving these exaggerated behaviors as ideas far from truth. So on top of systemic racism and colorism and sexism and fat phobia and low key classism that already has folks primed to see plus size darker skinned women a certain way, those same ideas continue to be reinforced and justified in media. This is a separate conversation, but I think there's also something to be pulled from here in the ways these pieces of media can reinforce transphobia that's already swirling around. This repeated encouragement to laugh at masculinized women, to perceive masculinized women as not women at all, but an other, if not outright a man. Something's going on here. But for this trope, we are at the point that a character doesn't need to be as half as absurd as Medea. Her existence is a visual cue that this woman will behave one of two ways. The expectation that she will function as someone's literal or emotional maid is the older image. Over time, this depiction has served black men in building their own platforms. It's easy to punch down, to make jokes about someone more marginalized than you in hopes that it'll push you higher up the social ladder. And even that ironically connects to the mammy trope in the sense that this flattened depiction of black women is still serving someone else. So let's recap. Instead of looking at remixes individually, today we focused on a few major traits of the mammy trope that have been concentrated and infused into multiple black women characters. Being a caretaker, being undesired, and having physical traits as a marker of morality or behavior. The three foundational black women tropes are all used to uphold white supremacy. 
But while the sapphire and the Jezebel are positioned as negative options, as poor and fortunate souls, the mammy is presented as the best a black woman can be, devoted and docile. This expectation of being a passive workhorse is one that also impacts real life. Going back one last time to Abby Mills, in an interview last year, Nicole Bahari revealed that her time playing that character irrevocably impacted her health. She was sick while they were filming and the people in charge of production didn't care about giving her enough time to heal. That happened because there's a pathology at work that has convinced a lot of people that black women are simply tools for their use. We are fed images and stories that say black women are just loyal servants. Black women are just the sassy best friend. Black women are just the calming therapist. Black women are just a suit for someone else to put on. Black women are just here for your enjoyment, your ease, your comfort, your profit. And all of that is rooted in the mammy trope. This might shock you, but I don't think caring for others is a bad thing. Granted that you don't lose yourself in the process. I don't think black women can't be portrayed as being on the ace spectrum. And in fact, I wish there were more better written ace characters across media. And that sentiment extends to darker skinned plus size black women who deserve to be portrayed as whole people. None of these traits are inherently negative. It's the way they've been used for centuries to craft shallow characters that has had an undeniably caustic impact on everything from books to films to TV shows to video games. I've said before that it's not enough to just plop a black character or specifically a dark skinned plus size woman into a story and call it a day. The way the mammy trope is embedded throughout media is perhaps the biggest proof of that. A lot of creators and producers and audience members need to interrogate why they feel that any black woman regardless of her initial role in the story, can be reduced to a prop. Because that's a deeper issue that can't simply be solved by casting Tessa Thompson as a secondary protagonist or race bending one out of every three redheaded comic book love interests. Especially that second one, actually, because something about race bending a character makes folks incapable of writing a story that already exists. I think pointing out these patterns is important it kind of gets harder to ignore something when it's listed right in front of you. And my hope is that naming these patterns helps other people get better at spotting them and in turn make more noise demand that creatives who are capable of seeing humanity in a range of people be given platforms over those who don't. But crafting a healthier media industry when tropes like this are at the root of it require more work than just naming that. We've all been indoctrinated at multiple levels to view black women as tools. There's tons of work out there tracing back as to why and how that started. Part of our job now is to question why it continues and how do we work against it? If you made it to the end, thank you for making it to the end. Are there any characters you feel are good examples of bad manifestations of these traits? Or good manifestations, manifestations too? Let's switch it up. That second trait was kind of hard because I realized a lot of black women characters, at least in racially mixed media, don't exist long enough to hit a point of worrying about her relationships. Also, if you're new here, welcome. I know the algorithm has finally smiled upon me, so big ups to the ones that owes. Okay, I recorded this before I hit a thousand subscribers, which, <laughs> wild. So this is not only a welcome, but a thank you for everyone who has subscribed. Yeah, that. anyway, back to the pre-edited stuff. I haven't actually thought about tropes in a while. I know I think a lot of people found me because of um the desirable dark-skinned woman trope and that made me realize that i still needed to like uh, unpack the mammy in a way or one way or another also someone left a comment about deliver us from eva which is a manifestation of the true trope and i don't know if there's much special there i think i need to rewatch that film um but all of that's to say that this might be the last trope we explore for a little while well who knows i never do Anyway, until next time, stay safe. 
I'll catch you in the next echo chamber.